Good evening. My thanks to the conference organizers. I'm very excited to be here tonight. And one of the really cool things about this conference is that we're all here because we use a lot of the same tools and technology, but we apply them to wildly different problems and fields. And so I'm here tonight to tell you a little bit about the specific field I work in, which is quantifying conflict violence. And I'm going to talk specifically about the ongoing conflict in Syria. But over the past 20 years, the Human Rights Data Analysis Group has worked in Guatemala, Colombia, Kosovo, Peru, and Timor-Leste. Now, the questions that we try to answer at first appear very straightforward. And in fact, in the case of Syria, it may even seem like we know the answer already. If you've been following this conflict at all, you know that it's a very well-documented conflict thanks in large part to citizen journalists who are using things like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to document the violence that's occurring in their country. And if you follow the mainstream media, you've probably heard many different reports about the numbers of individuals who've been killed in this conflict. And maybe you've even seen a map or a graph like this one. And I want to be clear here that I'm not picking on new scientists. There are a lot of different examples of this kind of data visualization out there. I just picked this one because it was particularly nice and concise for these purposes. But what I'm going to spend the next eight minutes or so trying to convince you is that despite these appearances, the hard truth is we don't know how many people have been killed in Syria. And in fact, the data we have available do not support these kinds of visualizations. And worse, these kinds of visualizations can be misleading because what they tell us about are reporting patterns. And those reporting patterns may not have any relationship to the true underlying pattern of violence. And when we see pictures like this, it's very natural, it's very intuitive to want to conclude things like the violence is increasing this month compared to last month the majority of the violence is occurring in this geographic region within the country. But those conclusions, based purely on this raw data, run the risk of being incorrect. So how do we get it right? We start with multiple data sources. In this case, four large documentation groups, the Syrian Center for Statistics and Research, the Syrian Network for Human Rights, the Syrian Shuhada website, and the Violation Documentation Center. And what we're looking at here are the counts of victims documented by each of those four sources over time. Now, the magnitude is different. You'll notice that the y-axes are a little bit different for each source. But the pattern over time looks to be the same. So starting from this point, we would be very tempted to conclude that these data sets are all telling us the same story that it's probably reasonable for us to move forward with our analyses. But our job as data analysts is to recognize that each of these data sources are incomplete in different ways and are telling us different stories, and to adjust for those differences, to model those documentation patterns. And that's what I'm going to talk about. As soon as we drill down to more specific questions, what happened in Aleppo in June 2013? We start to get conflicting narratives. Two of our sources document a peak in the violence during that time, and two of our sources don't. And again, to be very clear, these are not criticisms of any of these sources. All of these organizations are doing tremendous work. The goal here is not to identify the single best source, the goal is to recognize that each source has access to a different snapshot of the conflict and to adjust to model that difference. If we look at TARDIS, we see an example of what we call event size bias. All four of the sources document a large peak in violence in May 2013. Now, this corresponds to a very well-documented massacre that occurred in TARDIS during this time. But three out of our four sources show that as a relatively isolated event. Our fourth source, the Violation Documentation Center, the blue line at the top of the graph, shows that as the culminating event of an increasing pattern of violence. Again, each source 
captures a different snapshot of the conflict. So how can we start to adjust for this? We start with documented, identifiable victims. Some of you may have seen this report that came out last summer. We published it with the United Nations Office for the High Commissioner for Human Rights. And if you pause and think about conflict for just a moment, it rapidly becomes clear that documented, identifiable victims are but a subset of all victims. Of course, in conflict, there's going to be an unidentified body. Of course, in conflict, there's going to be a victim we don't learn about for months or years or decades. But as data analysts, we can estimate that missing piece. And when we start with documented, identifiable victims, we can use some of the tools that we've been talking about this week to start that estimation process. So what we do is we conduct record linkage across those four sources that I mentioned. And what does our data look like? This is a screen, crap, screen capture excuse me, from the Violation Documentation Center. It's a publicly available list of named victims. Anyone can scrape this website, access this data. If you decide to play along at home, I recommend clicking the Arabic button. They update the Arabic list with much more regularity than the English translation we're looking at now. This is the Syrian Center for Statistics and Research. Again, a publicly available list of named victims. Now, the data we have, compared to a lot of the examples we've been talking about this week, are relatively thin. We're looking to do record linkage, primarily relying upon name, date, and location. We occasionally have other demographic variables that we can feed into the model, but mostly we have those three variables. And so we look at as many features as we can. We compare the similarity of names. We look at how distant geographically and temporally the records are. And we try to identify records that refer to the same individual. We also create a training set. We have a native Arabic speaker review pairs of records and label them as referring to the same individual or not. And we feed those features and that training set into a classifier. Now, there are a lot of classifiers out there. We've tested a number of them. Currently, we favor random forests, but there are a lot of options out there. And all we're asking that classifier to do is to recognize multiple records that refer to the same individual victim. And at the end of the day, after classifying, clustering, and merging, what we have is a single data set where each row refers to a single, unique, identified victim, and there are columns that tell us the source or sources that documented that victim. And now we're making some progress. Now we can talk about documentation patterns. We can make a graph like this one, where the lowest, darkest shaded portion of each bar are the number of victims recorded in all four sources. The next recorded by three, two, one. And if you're like me, the next question is, well, how many victims were recorded by no sources. How many are we missing? And once we have our data organized in this way, we can actually use statistical models to estimate that. And once we have an estimate of what's missing, we can create what I think of as the documentation landscape. Now, I should emphasize that these are preliminary results, but what we're looking at here are maps of Syria shaded according to the documentation coverage. So the darker sections are areas of the country where we estimate more of the violence is going undocumented. And the lighter sections are areas of the country where the current documentation efforts are capturing most of the violence that's occurring. And the take-home message here, more than just the documentation rates themselves, is the wide variability shown in this figure. And again, if you think about it, of course, the documentation coverage is all over the place. These groups are recording information about victims in the midst of an active conflict. Of course, sometimes they get most of the story and sometimes they don't. And our job is to recognize that and to adjust for it. If we base our conclusions about what's happening in Syria on the observed data, on the reporting rates, we get those questions wrong. When we estimate what is missing, we have a much more accurate estimate of reality. And at HR DAG, we're here to get things right.
We're working very hard on this problem right now. I hope to have final results for you soon, so please stay tuned. Thanks very much.